Hey, everybody, and welcome to Unchurned, where we go behind the scenes of customer success and the customer-led growth movement. I'm here today with Rachel Proven. Rachel is a CS leader and executive with lots of experience in the industry. Uh, she's active in many of the different communities out there and is really helping to elevate customer success. So for, first of all, I want to thank you for that, Rachel, for your your, your heavy participation and, and, and activation in our community. And I want to welcome you onto Unchurned. Oh, thank you so much. That's so sweet of you. And honestly, I, I don't think I could stay out of our community if I wanted to. I need people to geek out about CS with. Well, now we're all calling you in, right? Because you built yeah. these relationships and, and we know how much you, you've inspired us in many of your, your posts on LinkedIn and, and other sources of content. You, you just wrote an article for Update AI for my company, right? And we're going to talk about that. Um, I want to jump in and, and for those maybe that, that, that don't know you yet, let's learn about Rachel. So uh, we're going to go through our rapid fire round of questions and then we'll go from there. First off, where were you raised and where do you live now? Mm. Uh, well, I was born in Manhattan, in New York City. Uh, I was mostly raised in New Jersey, in uh, like the Summit area, and then came screaming back at 18 uh, for school and never left. Uh, I'm in Brooklyn now. I was in Manhattan for almost 20 years and spent the last uh, seven or so in Brooklyn. A lifelong New Yorker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What was your first job? I owned a catering business starting at the age of 12. <laughs> at the age of 12? Wow, you were precocious. Illegally, you yes. were you were working at that age. Illegally, yes. But uh, people kept asking me to cook for their parties. I was something of a baker and uh, my mom, you know, pimped out my services early on. And all of a sudden people were asking for them. Also illegal. Yes, uh, asking for the for my baked goods at parties and, you know, things like that. And my mom was like, she's a kid and I'm tired of paying for all these ingredients. So we're gonna charge three times what it costs to make them. And no one's gonna take us up on that. So it'll be fine, you know, maybe occasionally you'll do it. And everyone was just like, yeah, okay, I'll pay $50 for a cake. Uh, so yeah, that helped buy my first car. <laughs> Well, you're, you're a regular attendee at the customer success happy hours that we have mm -hmm. at, at my uh, place. So now that I know about this, uh, these unsung skills, yes. I, I might expect a, a, a big treat next time. I do that. Uh, <laughs> we, maybe it wasn't your first job. I also know that you, you, you had a long uh, stint in acting. I did. I did that. I didn't start till I was 16 professionally. Uh, yes, I was an actress for many years, uh, both stage and screen, mainly uh, a lot of nice independent films, went to a bunch of festivals, it was really fun. Um, but, you know, when I turned 30 and hadn't become famous yet, I was like, maybe I need a job. Uh, I actually really started working in the CS field when I was 24, 25 or something like that. Uh, I was lucky enough that they, that the company I was working with would let me you know, take off a month, month and a half to go shoot a movie and then come back. Uh, so who wouldn't want that? You know, they let me keep my health insurance. It was amazing. And, uh, you know, I was basically, basically doing like production and account management then, but moved my way up quickly in the ranks there, especially once I uh, finished acting and got focused on CS. And that was during a time when you really couldn't hide from your, your company if they didn't want to give you the time off. So it was great that you found that. Now, I, I, I imagine there's many folks working remotely who are taking a day or two there for a, a shoot. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure they are. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was definitely not an option back then. Yeah. What's the most important metric in customer success? Hmm, that's a good question. Uh, I think customer health, but that's a tricky one to get right. If we're talking about just solid numbers, uh, never have a new retention. And our, and my underlying hypothesis about customer success is that it all comes down to relationship building. Mm -hmm. And I'm always interested in understanding what what are the, the the components of the best formed relationships outside of a relationship that you have with a family member. Mm -hmm. What's a relationship that you have developed that you cherish? That I've developed what? Sorry? That you've developed that you cherish. Ooh, outside of my family. You know, I have a number of friends who I've been friends with my entire life. 
and uh, they, I don't have siblings and they are the closest thing I have to that. Uh, you know, they, they know me better than I know myself. So uh, I've got two of those. Good. Let's jump into the CS content now, the meat and potatoes of our conversation. I hear a lot from customer success managers across all levels, from entry level into more leadership roles, that while we're all really excited that customer success is continuing to grow, and it really is, I think, at this inflection point where it's, it's just starting to really hit its stride, there's also this phenomena of burnout that's occurring because there's this growth in the importance of CS and its mandate and its, its scale, but not necessarily the same growth in budget and resources. And um, even if there were, I think this would still be the case. What, what are you seeing, hearing, feeling around this issue of burnout and fatigue potentially in the world of customer success? You know, I think it's one of the most challenging things that we're facing uh, in the industry. And it's something that a lot of people don't talk about, you know, especially in the CS community, we're all talking about how exciting it is and all these things we're doing, but nobody really talks about, I'm working till 11 o'clock at night. I'm, you know, I have so many things that are my responsibility. It's not possible to do them all and to do them well. Um, so that's something that I really work with uh, new CS leaders on is figuring out those boundaries of, you know, what should I be doing in a day? How much can I focus on at once and still be effective? And, and by the way, that, thank you for cueing me on that. I forgot to mention to folks that, that you, you you do run leadership coaching yes. for customer success uh, leaders, uh, provensuccess.com, I believe is the that's it. domain. That's it, yep. I help new customer so, success leaders, uh, you know, get up to speed fast, still have work-life balance, have an awesome strategy, and teach them management techniques to run rock star teams that always hit their metrics and love coming to work. What What do you advise to your clientele, to other CS leaders out there, CSMs, around you know how they can avoid that fatigue and burnout and have a more balanced life? You know the the first thing that I tell people to do is start protecting your calendar. Uh, if you leave it open, other people are going to take up all that time because CS is useful to every other department and that's great. But if you let other people determine where your time is spent, it's going to be spent on their initiatives and not your own. And you already have so many that the first thing that I advise is blocking off uh, two separate hours in your day, not including your lunch, please still eat lunch, please do it not on a call. Uh, yes, you can eat and take this time and still succeed, I promise you. Um, so what I advise is uh, you know, blocking those two hours and using them for strategic initiatives and actually labeling, you know, time blocking, labeling which thing you're going to work. I suggest picking two to three strategic initiatives per quarter, scheduling time to work on them every day, and just doing the very next step, whether that's writing an outline, whether it's writing an email, whether it's writing the first, you know, the first play in a playbook. You know, you don't have to think of doing everything all at once, but just be moving the needle forward a little bit because there's always going to be something urgent that's trying to take your attention. And if you never focus on those initiatives, on the, uh, you know, the important but not urgent, you're never gonna make any progress. Um, and I, yeah. I turn down a lot of meetings. Uh, I'm a big believer in that there are only four reasons to have a meeting. And that is to make a decision, solve a problem, share ideas, or to connect as a team. And those are all really important things, but it should never be a monologue. It should never be updates. It is a discussion. So if it's not gonna be a discussion- Have you ever turned down- Sorry? Have you ever turned down a meeting from a client or are these only internal meetings? No, no I mean, what I've done is I've managed expectations with a client. I've had clients, you know, especially back when I was a CSM and I've advised my CSMs on this sometimes, if you've got a weekly cadence going, check and see that they really want that. If you don't have agenda items to cover every week, 
and it's more just like, so what's happening? You know, what's going on this week? We all have things to do. They have things to do. Sometimes it's kinder to let them have that time. So if you find that happening, it, it can be reasonable to say, you know what, I see that we don't necessarily have urgent items all the time. It, would you want to have this time back? I'm always happy to be here, but I want to be cognizant of your time and the things you need to get done. It, is this something that you still want to do? And if so, you know, let's be really clear on what we're accomplishing here, because I always want to be adding value when I when I meet with you. Is it better to, in that case, is it better, let, let's say you have a, you want to have recurring meetings with your customers because you want to build the relationship. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a stake in the mm -hmm. ground that, that allows you to connect 100%. with them, right? And build a relationship. Yeah. And, and like we said, the building relationships is what matters, um, along with a good product experience. But is it better to, to then schedule that as a recurring session and each week or whatever the cadence is, review it um, and, and allow, is it better to have an opt-out or an opt-in effectively is what I'm saying, what we're trying to ask. That's a good question. Early on, um, you know, at the beginning of that relationship, I think they should be scheduled. And I think you have exact things that you're going to be covering. And you should know, you know, sort of the product adoption trends of your product. If you're just learning it, okay. You know, then you're figuring it out along the way. But if you know basically how long it takes not to onboard, but to adopt. That's when you really want to be having those conversations because nothing is going to build that relationship so much as trust. You know, following through on what you said it was going to be like, getting them that result. If they know they can trust you, you know, they don't need to talk to you every week. They know, you know, this person's going to help me get it done. I can trust what they say. I can trust them to deliver. I think you make a good point there. I think there's an opportunity even if you have to cancel a meeting, the way that you do it is really important. And that can that can even be an opportunity, yeah. like you're saying, to build trust. You can turn, hey, I'm so sorry, I can't make this meeting. We, we have some things that are stuck or we, we're still investigating. And here, if, if you're very candid and transparent, what I found in very recent experience, by the way, because I've, I've done this to a couple of, uh, of folks recently, um, and the response that I got back from the meeting cancellation, assuming that the cancellation is not five minutes before the meeting, which always happens too, right? So that maybe that's one rule of, that's the first rule of, uh, of this, right? Is, is, is be prepared in that. But I've gotten response back from folks of, thank you so much for, for being transparent. I really appreciate it. Looking forward to rescheduling in two weeks or whatever the case might be. And it, and you could, and it was nice because it was like, oh, wait, that's cool. That actually worked. And I built trust and I didn't even have to go through and fake a meeting with them or take, take up either of our time. Yeah. I mean, if you have something crucial that you're supposed to be discussing, outline the high points in, in a note. Again, these things should be discussions uh, or building that relationship because that is a reason to have a meeting. But, you know, if if you're, you have a relationship meeting and, and you need to defer it, you know, send them an article that, that you thought would be useful to them that's, that's relevant to their field. You know, connect in that way and say, you know, mm -hmm. I can't wait to talk to you in X number of weeks. I'm still thinking about this thing that we talked about the other day. Um, you know, those are ways that you can move that forward without taking up an hour of somebody's time. Yes, it's great to be on the phone with yeah. them and build those relationships. And, you know, if it were possible to have effective CS without that, we'd all kind of be in trouble probably. Um, but it's, it's a fine line. You don't want to be, you always want to deliver value. You never want to be seen as a time suck. So if you can bullet the things that are updates, you know, just here's the facts, here's what you need to know, and then use your meeting to discuss them, to say, here's how this applies to you. Here's what we can do with this strategically. What questions do you have? Then, you know, you're, you're really respecting their time that much more. You mentioned agendas mm -hmm. earlier Favorite. on. Yeah. What's the magic to those? How do you structure okay. those? Okay. So this is something that it took me a while to develop, but I get really excited about because it was such a game changer for me and my team. Um, so keeping in mind that these are not going to be for updates, but updates still need to happen. I create an agenda. Um, you know, it's going to be the same week to week. We start with weekly wins, one personal, one professional, and that's the connecting part. And you can be as open or, you know, or not with that as you want. You can talk about your family. You can say, I had the best sandwich of my life the other day. Here's what was on it. You know, it, it doesn't have to be 
intrusive. But that's the way you. These are internal. These internal, are internal. Oh, one hundred percent. I'm sorry. This is a team yeah. meeting. Yeah. Yes, my weekly yeah. team yeah. meeting. Yeah, 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 that'd be a little weird to, you know, talk. Though you did talk to a client <laughs> about that. Beats the weather. Um, but, uh, right. you know, whenever you're building those relationships, but for the internal meetings, the way I've set it up is win of the week. Um, everybody goes around. Then we have specific things that we're going to discuss. Uh, generally looking at what are those uh, strategic initiatives that we're working on. Um, are we coming up against any roadblocks? We're looking at our metrics, how we're doing versus how we're supposed to be doing, better or worse. And then we're saying, do we see any trends here? What is looking at these numbers telling us? That both teaches the team and a lot of times it'll unearth things that as the leader, you didn't know because they're there in the trenches and they hear someone else mention, oh, well, this has been going on with my client. And then you hear, oh, mine too. And it starts to uncover trends there. Um, beyond that, I like to talk about, you know, here's something that worked really well for me this week. Here's something that crashed and burned. Uh, so we don't make the same mistakes. Uh, and it also helps develop psychological safety to see like, okay, you can say this didn't work and no one's mad at you. Um, and that's something where as the leader, you have to go first there when you're bringing that forward. You can say, hey, I, you know, maybe I try this format and maybe it crashes and burns, but you know what? You never learn if you never try. So, uh, yeah. and finally, what I, what I do so that people are able to get those important updates in is a few days before the meeting, the, the agenda is available to everyone. Uh, everyone is expected to put their updates in a read-only section. It has a spot for their name. You say like, this is the project or this is the, you know, the thing I'm updating you on. Here's the updates. If anyone has any questions on those, uh, then they can write them beneath. If it starts to look like, okay, this is something we need to discuss, you move it up into the regular agenda because we need to have a discussion. But this way it's not, you know, people droning on about projects that maybe everyone's not involved in, you know, if it could have been an email, if you can read it, that to me, that's so much better and so much better for async, being able to, to take that information. So we're talking about mm -hmm. internal team meetings and how to get them running it, running at all cylinders. Um, and it, it sounds to me like you have a, this is a Google doc that you set up that, that people can just input in or what, what's the actual format? I, I used, I used a program that is now defunct, but uh, you can do it in Notion. You can do it in Google docs, <laughs> uh, anywhere that you can all see what's happening there and where you can tag people uh, will work for this. Okay. Okay. So we've arrived to the meeting and we have a sense of, of our, conversation that we want to have and, and and you're helping to 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 cultivate and curate what people are mm -hmm. bringing to the table and then ultimately have that discussion i'm interested actually also to go back to what you said about mm -hmm. trends and 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 folks so th i take it that's really just an open discussion like you said that you're, you're developing psychological safety you're making the room just very transparent open honest and then you're just discussing things that come up how are you documenting those trends? We're taking notes during the meeting. Um, you know, it obviously it's much better if you can have a tool where you can just be clicking a button and, and getting an insight written down. You know, I find that the documentation of these things is probably the most tedious part of customer success. So really any way to automate that and get it into a system of record is obviously ideal. Um, you know, and it's, it's only been recently that we've really been able to do that. That's always been customer facing. People haven't thought to use it internally yet. And it's such a great use case. Yeah. You had said something earlier about, um, this note of documentation. I, I know that, that you strongly believe in yeah. well-documented <laughs> things and, I've seen I've seen from you in the past um, comments and posts and things of that nature about how we can document our personal mm -hmm. wins as accomplishments and store those over times. And I think that's really, I've actually done that in the past for for myself. I, I my last job, Boston Consulting Group. It was a very 
rigorous type of, of, um, of process of review. And so I said, okay, well, shit, I'm going to start documenting my own stuff so that when it comes to filling out that, that hour long form of what did you do the past six months, I remember it. Talk a little bit about your, your strategy and philosophy around this. Cause I, I think it's interesting. I think it's really helpful for, for folks that are maybe a little bit younger in their careers. Something that made a huge difference in my career that got me promoted again and again, got me raises. Uh, and it's just, it's just an Excel file that I have. That's an accomplishment tracker. I have it on my website, Provan Success. You can download it for free. Um, but basically it, as you said, you, sometimes you don't remember all the good stuff you did. There's something called recency bias, where the stuff you did most recently seems more important than the stuff you did before, because the way that it made your life easier back then, you now kind of take for granted. So what this is, is, you know, once a week, you spend 10 minutes, you know, on a Friday at the end of the day, and you say, what did, what did I accomplish this week? And you write down, you know, sort of the, uh, what you were working on, um, and you so document, once a week. yeah, so once, so once a week, a week yeah. you just look at what you've accomplished or what you're working towards. You're not going to have a huge win every week, but what are you working towards? And then you document the situation, um, like the circumstance, what you're, what you're working on, uh, the task, the actions you're taking, um, oh, situation, task, how you're, how you're going about it. Like the challenge, I would say the situation is the challenge task, what you have to do the actions you're taking and the results you get. And results are especially important because you want to say there, hey, this is how we were different after I did this. It's great if you can have some sort of metric to tie to that, some sort of numbers. And I think this is something that scares most people. They're like, I don't have that information. You know, I don't know to what extent that increased productivity. I don't know to what extent we made more money. Ask ask for an estimate, say, you know, hey, I know we worked on this. I just want to make sure that it was valuable. You know, um, how much time would you say that it took you before we did this? OK, and how much now? That's all. Ask a couple people. You know, no one is going, you know, so long as you're not making things up out of whole cloth and doing a reasonable uh, estimate, that's that's all you need. So having just a summary of what you did, why it matters and and the the outcome is really useful because then by the end of the year or whenever you're having your review, you can pull out this document that says, uh, you know, kind of organize it and just say, here are my biggest accomplishments this year. Here's why I feel really good about them. Here are the results I got for the company. And especially during an economic downturn, you want that in your corner. You want to be able to show people like, hey, I'm a huge asset here. Here's the things I'm doing for you in this short of an amount of time. Um, you know, the time I'm saving you, the money I'm bringing in, the money I'm saving you. And it's also something you want to do because it helps you update your resume. Um, you now have all of your accomplishments and metrics that can go right on there uh, whenever you need that. Or even if you just want to update your LinkedIn with them so that maybe someone else sees, maybe you're ready to move to director. Maybe I want that person as a director. It's never... It's not braggy, it's not bad. You're giving people the information, but don't shortchange yourself and focus on everybody else's stuff and not take 10 minutes a week to, you know, to be able to bookmark your progress. And you know what, some days we all have really, really crummy days and we feel like we're terrible at this or that it's never gonna work. It's really nice to be able to refer back to that accomplishment tracker and say, you know what, okay, I did all that. So clearly that's not a hundred percent reality of what I'm feeling right now. So lots of uses for that. Yeah. I really like that. I really like that. I mean, it goes back to the saying, if you don't believe yeah. in yourself then who will it, you know, we, it's not, it doesn't have to be boastful or, or, or braggy, but just being able to, to document mm -hmm. those little wins, they, they add up, they accrue yeah. over time. When I was doing this in, in my last role a couple of years ago, and and after this conversation, maybe I should start to to bring this back in, into my workflow. Um, I actually would would have a. I don't think I use Excel. I think I use Google Sheets, and that way I could actually have mm -hmm. a bookmark on in my bookmark bar in Chrome. And if I, there was something that just came up in the moment, oh, let me just go click on 
the the Google Sheet and just add it right now. And it you know it wasn't even like I had to to set aside ten minutes a day to, to mm -hmm. think back. It was just in that very moment. Um, let me let me go and document it. And I agree with you. Now, do you do you advocate to be continually refining and updating your 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 LinkedIn profile, your yeah. resume, your CV, those sorts of things? I do because it's yeah. less overwhelming when you decide that you need that information. Um, it's also good for the, your accomplishments to be out there. Um, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean you're looking for another job, but I think there's nothing wrong with, you know, certainly don't put every single accomplishment on there. That gets to be a bit much, but, you know, maybe take your top three per year and, and throw it on there. When you're looking at, at updating a resume, maybe taking the top three in different areas that you excelled and using those as bullet points for your resume. You know, just just really choosing the biggest accomplishments, the biggest highlights instead of, OK, these are the ones I remember from recently. I want to round us out in the conversation with the, the last question for you. Mm -hmm. We're it's crazy to say it. We're almost in Q4 right now uh, of 2022. As we turn the corner to, towards the end of the year. What excites you the most about what you're seeing in customer success? I tend to look for um, look for the things that we can be making better. Look for the things where we're not being honest with ourselves. Because okay. honestly, like everything <laughs> is super rosy and okay. online and in podcasts, and I don't like to contribute to that narrative and make people feel like everyone's winning at this than me. You know, it's like here's what winning actually looks like. I like that. You know, um, it's like it's like looking at Instagram and thinking that's supposed to be your life. You know. So what, 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 how would you mm -hmm. like me to tee that up for you? What's something, what's a trend that you're noticing in customer success? Um, you know, what is, something, what is something you think needs to be okay. talked about more in customer success? Something like that. Yeah. Let's do that. Let's do that. Okay. I want to round us out here with this last question. And I want to ask you, Rachel, what's something that maybe is not discussed as much as it should be that you're seeing or feeling? You know, that's something that I think about all the time because there, there are many things. Uh, but I think really something that is not necessarily clear is what actual success looks like in the real world. You know, we have a little bit of an echo chamber going on in the CS community because we all are really excited about it. We know what we can do with it. We know what it can do. It's so exciting. And we want other companies to be excited about it, to be using it more, and they are. But what's happening is they're not understanding what goes into that. And just as we need to give realistic expectations to our customers, we need to with our CEOs and we need to with each other. We need to tell each other, this is what success looks like. Here are some of the stumbling blocks. You know, if your CEO doesn't get it and they think you're supposed to be able to, you know, take it to positive NRR from, you know, 50% churn in six months, that's not anything you're doing wrong. You know, it's, it's a matter of setting expectations and showing people it, customer success is complex. It, it takes time to build properly like a house and you can't expect to be building the roof while you're working on the foundations. So I think it's important. I think LinkedIn can become very much like Instagram where everything looks perfect and rosy and we don't see that people are struggling whenever I've said anything about, you know, I know a lot of people who are struggling with mental health. I see people, I, I think the, that I heard the, the average term for a customer success leader is one and a half years. That's short for leadership position. And it's yeah. because we're burning out or unrealistic expectations of what we should be able to accomplish in that time. So we need to, to put up those boundaries. We need to yeah. say, here's what's realistic. You know, yes, you can get there, not tomorrow. Here's what it's going to take. Here's, you know, the manpower, the, the tools, this is what's involved in getting you the result you're talking about. It's, it's going to require more than, you know, one CSM. It's a great point. We all want to elevate the function because it is 
part of of a movement behind customer led growth, a movement into this 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 business model that we know to be so effective, but patience is a virtue, <laughs> and we need the resources to get there as well. Yeah, just like the way you explain to your customers, okay, here's your, here's where we are, here's your desired outcome, and here are all the steps from A to B. You know, high level. This is what it's going to take to get there. We've got to do that when we start new jobs. That's a, a hugely important thing. It's setting those boundaries and expectations so that in our excitement, we're not shooting ourselves in the foot. Rachel Proven, you always keep it so real in <laughs> in these conversations that we have together. And in the content that I see, it's very tactical. It's very crisp, clear, and very, very value add. So thank you very much for being on the show and for the conversation. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.